shout out five guys Let's give it, it give it a go give it a go dude we'll these you. are my favorite burgers i know this is um it, five guys i don't know if you guys ever had five guys burgers but dude i love them like five guys is ugh. it's yeah. the best my buddy always preaches to me he's like shake shack and i'm like shake shack man i'm like no shake i will say shake shack's um cheese fries are actually very delicious but i'm not a fi- I, i'm sorry i'm not a shake shack kind of guy you know, I I do really enjoy Five Guys personally. Um, yeah. All right, everybody, welcome back to Matt Money. Uh, welcome back to the Cashflow Chronicles. Hey, uh, we actually have. Uh, actually, I'll probably wait a little bit because we only got 19 people in here, and we we generally speaking will will ramp up over time. But it's gonna be a long night for those of you guys that are here to watch me stream, watch Hot Chris. Uh, crap, just Chris. Uh, and then also uh, our fans of Rocket Lab, we are going to, after 10 p.m. my time, be switching over to a secondary stream to specifically launch, uh, watch the rocket launch that Rocket Lab is doing in New Zealand, Launch Complex number one. Chris, feel free to stay, but I know you also have to work as well. So, uh, And you're also just fresh off of another hour of streaming on Finance Junkies. But I'm excited. Uh, it's the first launch since... 3Q. So hopefully it'll make it number launch, launch number 10 uh, this year for Rocket Lab. And hopefully it's a successful one so we can build and hopefully get close to 20 launches next year. So I'm I'm pretty excited about that one. Um, so we're just giving Chris the quick opportunity to, to crush this. What do you what what's the order, man? Give give us the peak. What's the order? What, what do you mean? What's the you know, do you get pickles, you get ketchup you get mayo what's what's the real deal over there mm. it's just a regular cheeseburger with cheese mayo onions tomatoes and jalapenos Ooh, not nothing complex no lettuce no i don't like lettuce no huh? no lettuce yeah, it's, it's very around. simple but it's good man i like it i will say we uh i think that you know you kind of hit something on the head yesterday with respect to getting involved in an ETF, which let me just share it up on the screen. And, you know, I'm not going to be laborless too much, but Tom Lee is very much in the same boat as you with respect to where he's going to put his capital. He's thinking Russell 2000. You're thinking the mid cap. I think that you were probably right with this one. The, the thing that, I think scares me a little bit about the Russell and you alluded to it yesterday is you have a lot of companies that are underperforming one and then two. So that obviously a cut to interest rates would help them out in the next six months to a year, but they're also still not profitable. So like if you're looking for a trade, I would say the Russell 2000 may be a better trade but in terms of a long-term hold, I would say the mid caps is probably better for the reasons you alluded to yesterday, which is most of these guys are still extremely profitable. You don't have as many zombies as you do in the Russell 2000, but I'd say a quicker pop. And this generally speaking is always the case. Small cap during recessions gets hits the hardest, but in a recovery, small caps also recover the hardest, which is Generally speaking, not over the last 10 years, but generally speaking, if you look over the course of 100 years or so, small caps uh, will outperform the S&P 500 most of the time. But obviously, we haven't been in that boat because the Magnificent Seven or FANG or however you want to call them, as they've alluded to and changed over the past 10 to 15 years, have really been the the jumping board for returns in this in this market. So anyway, uh, we bought a share of this, or half a share of this, as you asked me yesterday. And I, I agree. I think that this, this one's a good one. And it pays a pretty small dividend, but allows us to get a little bit of a drip. And then we also bought some more BPY PM. So some more Brookfields. And we were up like two and a half percent or something in the in the portfolio today so any thoughts uh no, i'm trying to give you a little bit of breathing room so you can chew but 
<laughs> Sorry, man. No, this you're is good. Your, Wait, this you is can't. No, 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 no. Don't apologize. You don't eat cold five guys. You eat that shit as soon as you get it. I get it. <laughs> this is um this is like Chris and uh Matt's mukbang. <laughs> 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 we're, we're doing a mukbang right now. Um so my thing is there's still a lot of SPACs out there in the lower part of the small cap space. That's what I'm worried about. The fucking SPACs that are still alive. So unlike in the previous past where you didn't have a lot of these SPACs, unprofitable SPACs, I think a lot of them are going out of business every day. Mm. And so I don't want to be in them. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I want to avoid the, avoid the small, um, small companies that are that were able to despack they still have cash on the balance sheet and they could survive for another three four years with just their existing cash but they won't show any meaningful return so i'd rather be in companies that are just a little bit above that so two billion to ten billion i think is the perfect range to be in so yeah there was there's a lot of specs out there that were able to kind of get in there and start off at like five to ten billion that have now gone down say 80 90 percent so that kind of gets them out of the range that you're kind of talking about you know uh south of two billion dollars and and rocket lab actually was one of those companies for a while uh it it dropped down to like close to one and a half to two billion dollars in market cap and now it's starting to to get a little bit of love and and we'll see that one um i'll stream on that uh in the in the uh after hours here but let's just pull up the portfolio while we're talking about it briefly let me just make sure i don't make a stupid move and accidentally share all of my other stuff uh there we go dean asked a really good question can you tell why spacs are bad okay not all spacs are bad don't get me wrong there are some good spacs out there you can't say that every single spac out there is is terrible so if i was a spec rocket labs a spec yeah. there's so many yeah. different specs but they didn't go through the traditional IPO process that most public companies would have to go through. So there's a lot of scrutiny that happens by Wall Street prior to a company being able to be listed. With SPACs, it's just been a combination of, hey, you have this company with a sponsor, they de-SPAC, they, they, you know, they provide um, the capital and boom, now you got yourself a publicly listed company and you know, and literally there's the, the chance of them failing is really bad. So, yeah. Um, and so the sponsor, the sponsor usually walks away with most of the money too. That's the other thing, you know? So, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's part of it. Right. So like when you were talking about, um, you know, Garcia said Shamat Palapatia, like he bought, he, he was pr trying to bring up literally an alphabet of, of SPACs to bring to market, right? So the first one was Virgin Galactic. Uh, the second was SoFi. The third was Open Door, or maybe it was um, Clover Health or something like that. And the and one, maybe Open Door was on its own. I don't remember, but um, I forget what IPO E ended up being. But regardless, um, yeah, he brought back brought to market at least three or four. SPACs and SoFi, I think, actually is one that's going to survive and do relatively well. And Virgin Galactic now is actually in commercial flight. So, you know, they were burning a crap ton of cash. But Chris is right. I mean, the preferred equity, right? It's not preferred shares like normal sense, like we're talking about, but they're basically getting really, really cheap shares and warrants uh, to, to be able to bring it to market because they're the first people that are bringing all this cash. Right. So then they make it go public and you're getting things that maybe five times, six times more expensive is what these guys did. And so when it goes public and let's just say goes at ten dollars a share, their cost basis might be like a dollar, dollar fifty. And then after the time period that kind of after the dease back happens, they're able to finally sell their shares like six months or so after. And then they just crater everything because their cost basis is so cheap. And they did it just because they're like. Well, we can buy it in a dollar fifty. If we're able to sell it six bucks, we four x our money. I turned one hundred fifty into six hundred million, and I'm good to go. And then I can do that again and find another spec. And but not all specs are bad, right? Some of them are just an opportunity to have a hundred, two hundred million dollars on as a blank check. And it's an old family business like Snyder's Pretzels, that's been around for hundred 
over a hundred years and a lot of other companies that have, have been going uh, SPAC as well. It's just an opportunity for people to collect a little bit of money and it's an opportunity for other investors to potentially get into a company rather cheap. So it is what it is. But we had some runners today, Chris. ABCL, TQQQ is always printing money, except for today. Uh, what else What else went on a little bit of a run? Oxy went on a bit of a run. Rocket Lab went on a little bit of a run today. Uh, HashiCorp. Uh, what else? I'm trying to think. But yeah, we were up. Uh, we, we came down. We were up at 2.5% at one point today, but now we're back up to, I think... I think this is still the around the all-time high that we are in the portfolio, which is 1,072 bones. So pretty excited about that. We'll get there. We'll get to the, the 100K mark eventually. You know, a lot of these things are great dividend payers. So next month, we'll should see some dividends coming in as well. You know, we'll keep adding to it. Our, uh, our yield is about 60, 65 bucks a year right now. Nice. That's where we're at, which is pretty, which is pretty dope. Uh, actually, while we have some folks on here, first and foremost, if you guys don't already, please be sure to check out Chris's Patreon. The link is in the description. Also, there's a new link in the description as well. Actually, let me keep this snippet as well, just in case we want to refer back to the portfolio. There's a new link in the description, also pinned comment, which is the, the new channel that Chris and I will be transitioning to. Uh, so please check out the pinned comment or the link in the description. We're currently at 19 subscribers here. Let's just take a quick look. Up to 35, Chris. That's pretty dope. I can't complain with that. It's probably because all of your tweets uh, that you that you tweeted. So appreciate everybody so far uh, that is that have subscribed to the new Cashflow Chronicles channel. Eventually, I think maybe in the few. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how the best way to do it is. I'm not sure. If all the replays will go on to the Cashflow Chronicles to be able to get us up. And actually, I was going to simulcast onto Cashflow Chronicles, uh, the new channel. But the problem with simulcasting is as soon as I connect it up to StreamYard, they want it to be like 24 hours in advance or something like that. So it's like, damn. So technically tomorrow uh, around this time, we'll be able to to start streaming to, uh, to cash for Chronicles, but appreciate it. We're already up to 47. That's awesome. So, uh, would like to get this up to a thousand, uh, and eventually Chris and I can move over to their full time. And I think that that'll give us a little bit more freedom. Uh, and then Chris can, uh, have full access. I think I saw the, I, that reminds me, I have to give you the password on everything, Chris. Um, it's super, super simple, um, for us to, to kind of keep track of and, uh, that way you have access to it and you can do any changes, have any editing rights or respond to comments or what have you. So uh, really excited about this. Chris and I are really, uh, really, really happy. We, I think we work really well together. People really have been receiving us pretty well. And I've heard very few negative things to say. It's mostly been positive. I have people. Don't worry, it's coming. <laughs> Don't worry. It's what coming. the negativity? Yeah. The yeah. thing that I think most people uh, have is that we don't spend enough time answering uh, their questions for free, um, which, uh, you know, that's always going to be. Uh, I try to answer as many questions as I can. And we do. Yeah, we, yeah. we try to do a, a good job of that. But uh, excited to see where this takes us. It's it's going to yeah. be a long journey. But um, we both we both have aspirations to do this more full time. So, yeah. so um, I don't know if you have any topics to talk about today, but I think I have one that... Um, that could interest a lot of people. I've been talking about it for a little while with regards to how preferred shares work. Um, I'm sorry about eating, by the way. I'm just this is my first meal of the day. Yeah, you, do, you can't. I'm not complaining. Yeah, maybe other I people. Work over, I work overnight. I go to sleep like I'm awake during the market open, and usually try to nap during the middle of the day. And then I usually take Patreon calls, and then after that, I I try to you know, be awake. And so right now my wife just came home. She got me some dinner. So that's, that's nice. Um, but overall, there are a lot of great opportunities going forward. Um, and I think right now is a great time to really, if you're looking for some good, safe yielding assets, if you know the underlying base case for it, you can make some really good money 
very safely, which ha does not typically happen a lot. Usually there's a lot of risk associated with making money, but this is the first time in a long time where I'm actually seeing a lot of opportunities where it's almost like no brainers, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest no brainer in my opinion is um, the current preferred shares. I've been talking about it on the Patreon um, and it's this right here. Let me just share my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, da, 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 da. Okay. So a, don't follow is, Chris's uh, Patreon. The link's in the description. Yeah. So this one right here is called Brookfield Property um, Preferred Preferred Shares. Now, the word, the way that preferred shares work is actually very simple. When you look at preferred shares on a, let me see, right here. Let me just, and this is this is actually in Robinhood, even though Robinhood does not offer preferred shares for some reason. Yeah. That's um, strange. But I mean, you know what? I take that back. They might. They just might not be offering this one. Oh, uh, okay. let me check. I, when yeah. we looked at BPA, oh no, this one's in here. Yeah, Brookfield okay. is. No, no, it's it's there as a listing, but you can't buy it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. stock's not supported. So right here, when you look at common stock versus preferred stock, um, and I know someone in the comment section, Jordan, you you want to know the difference? I will definitely explain the difference. But first, I want to explain the difference between common stock and equity preferred equity, preferred stock because the first thing you just got to know that typically speaking um common stock has the common stock has the ability to do a lot of liquidity so most of the company stock is usually in common stock right this is the stuff that gives you part ownership over the company which is great you know um you also have voting rights associated with that common stock most people they you know, they don't really vote in the, the, these days. Most of the time, especially if you have like an index fund, mm -hmm. the manager of that index fund votes for you <clears throat> or on your behalf. So like, let's say right now you bought the Vanguard ETF. Vanguard, through your ownership, owns a whole bunch of shares <laughs> in some companies. And so they technically vote for you, you know. Yes, and then do. the last thing <clears throat> is dividends. So some stocks they offer dividends to their to their shareholders you know so you look at some companies like verizon verizon gives a nice seven percent dividend right now but remember the dividend is based on existing cash flows and so the company is in no has no um has no fundamental guarantee that they have to give you dividends they can cut the dividend at any time and i'm sure that you as a dividend investor matt have been in companies where you're like oh my god this is a great company it's giving me this six percent yield and then one day they just like hey sorry the business is not working that great you know and basically they cut the dividend and yeah. now you were hoping for income and the income just stops you know um with preferred it's a little bit different um and this is where sometimes the opportunities are that not a lot of people know about but they have a lot of bond-like qualities what does this mean this means that typically companies when they issue preferred shares they are guaranteeing you a fixed return as an interest um, when you buy the preferred share and they're saying hey we are going to guarantee you that we are going to give you x y and z for lending us this money there are a lot of terms and a lot of covenants that come with preferred shares things that um things that you may not find in the common stock so another thing that you have is dibs on dividends what does that mean that means that before a company can pay out dividends to its common stockholders, it has to pay dividends to its preferred holders. So a lot of times businesses, if they're not doing too well, they'll cut the common dividend, but they won't cut the preferred. If they're in real dire straits, what they can do is pause the dividends on their, on their preferreds, but they can't get rid of them. So a lot of times what happens is you have accumulation rights. So basically if a preferred share, if, they, if the company can't make its payments, it will let the, it will let that those payments end up accumulating. And until that accumulation is not cleared, it can't go back to paying common stock dividends again. So that's another thing. So you get this benefit of having that. Now, so that's why you see here payment priority if the company goes bankrupt. Typically speaking, preferred equity has more rights than common. So it usually starts with first lien debtors that have um, something called secured bonds, right? Those are your primary guys that get paid out first. So if you go bankrupt, when they sell all your shit, the first people to get paid is them. They usually get paid out whole. 
a hundred percent of whatever was lent to them. Now, what's good is that asset is actually very safe and very secure. So there's a lot of companies right now that, um, or a lot of funds that all they do is just buy first lien debt. First lien means you're, you're going to get paid. And then you have second lien debt, which means now you're going to have some sec security, but it's going to be guaranteed by things that are not covered under the first lien. And then you have unsecured debt. Unsecured debt means that it's almost like you're giving them money as a debtor, but it's with the full faith that they'll pay you back. There's no actual like assets, guarantee, asset guarantees that the company has to make in order to, you know, in order to, to make it happen. So a lot of times unsecured debtors are the ones that are usually left holding the bag. And last but not least, in terms of debt structure, you have preferred equity. They get paid out after the unsecured guys. So it goes from secured debt to unsecured, I mean, uh, secured, secured debt to unsecured debt to preferred, preferred stock. Now, a lot of times when it comes to preferred stock, especially in a bankruptcy, most preferred holders get wiped out too. So don't, don't get me wrong. Don't think that there's like some kind of magical force that's giving you money. Yeah. It all just depends on the Especially if there's, if there's negative, uh, negative cash balance, if there's net debt. Yeah. yeah. So generally speaking, you don't want to, you don't want to rely on the safety of a preferred stock as the means to why you want to buy into it. Because in terms of bankruptcy, it's like, oh yeah, let me buy the preferred into a bankruptcy. No, you're, you're, you're literally like the second to last guy to get paid. You don't want to be the second to last guy. You either want to be first in the line or right behind that guy. The last thing you want to be is behind you definitely don't want to be in common which is like way you're 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 at the back of the line but you also don't want to be the second to last guy either right so in terms of safety preferred is not the way that you would normally go that route if you think a company is going to go bankrupt and hoping that you can actually make more money in the bankruptcy unless you have some magical insight into their assets that could be worth a lot more than than preferred equity is not the way to go um now, there are some key differences between preferred stock and common. Preferred stock usually comes with um, two provisions that are very important to look at. Number one is what the, the face value of that preferred stock is. Most of the time, it's around $25. But there's also clauses in there that allow you to convert your preferred shares into equity sometimes. And so what happens is, oh, well, let's say you have a $25 preferred stock, right? And... It's great, but let's say the common stock runs up 500%. Now you would think like, wow, me as a preferred holder, I got screwed over. What the hell? You know, like I, I didn't, I didn't get the 500% gain like the common stock guy did. Well, sometimes the companies are generous enough to actually put that in the provision where they say, look, if you want, we will let you convert the preferred shares into common shares in the future at a, at a fixed price. So that's another another thing that can happen. So a lot of preferred stock investing is more understanding the legalese behind how that preferred stock was issued rather than basing it just on, purely on the fundamentals of the company itself. So that's why preferred invest, preferred stock investing is not something that a lot of retail holders do or should do in my opinion. I think if you get into preferred shares, you just have to be, you have to be very knowledgeable about the underlying security that you're purchasing. Now, the the company that I'm particularly looking at is Brookfield Asset, uh, Brookfield Partners. So, let me just uh, bring this up, Brookfield, Brookfield Property Partners. Brookfield Property Partners owns a lot of Class A real estate, not just here in the U.S. but around the world. Um, the thing is, though, their stock price was not doing well. <clears throat> they, they were having some challenges here and there. Um, so what did they do? They took it private. And so now Brookfield Property Partners is a private company under the Brookfield, uh, Brookfield um, um, uh, Asset Management um, umbrella. Now, the one thing that they do still have publicly listed is the preferred units. Now, the preferred units, each of them come with a different term, right? So if you look at here, you can see here cumulative, redeemable, perpetual, right? What does this mean? Cumulative means that any debt, I mean, any um, payments that they miss, they accumulate. Redeemable means that you have a fixed price, which this thing can be redeemed at by the issuer. 
And the last one is perpetual, which means that there's no end date. Like you, you are, you are going to get paid forever and ever and ever. Like there's no, there's no um, end date for this one. Now, why, what does each one, what does each one do? What does each one mean? This is where you have to really look into the prospectus and you have to go through each one. And then this way you can understand the differences between all of them. So you can see here, the main differences right now, just from a, from a very bird's eye point of view is number one, the distribution. BPY, BPY PPO gives you a 6.5% annualized distribution on a $25 face value um, asset. So which means that right now, if you bought it today on face value of 25, but you're buying it at a discount of 12, you're actually not getting 6.5. You're getting a 12% yield. Well, not 12, yeah. almost a 13% yield, right? That's That's number one. Number two is... When you buy this, a lot of these things are offered over a specific period of time. So each issue is different. So if you see here, BPYPO was issued at a later time. So you can see here that the distribution is 6.3. BPYN was issued, you know, a little bit differently after that. So it was issued with a 5.75%. Um, and then last but not least, BPYPM, which is the one that I like, ha was created out of the deal with shareholders who were converted from BPY shareholders to BPYPM. It was part of their offering. So the offering was, hey, either we'll give you cash or we will give you ownership stake via the preferred shares. And so some people could have opted for the BP, BPYPM. And so a lot of people with that. What I like about BPYPM is that they have priority over some assets versus these guys. So there's a little bit more safety here than over here. I'm not going to go too far into it because I think that would require a lot of explaining, but I like BPYPM because there's a little bit more safety here. But this does not mean that this is the one that you, you know, should 100% buy also. Some of these other ones have um have some provisions in there that could make them attractive. I'll give you an example of something that's really attractive, which is BPYPO. If we look at their prospectus, let me just uh, stop here and show this one. This is what a prospectus looks like. Okay. And I want to say right when, when people are investing in ETFs or anything like that, reading the prospectus is extremely valuable because I think sometimes people will just invest blindly into an ETF. And the thing that's beautiful about it, the uh, prospectus is it literally – Literally on the very front page, it should state what the objective of the ETF or, in this case, the preferred units are. And if mm -hmm. that does not align towards what you are doing as an investor or it's not 100% clear, then ask someone or just don't invest in it. Because a lot of times I hear people just invest blindly into ETFs and it blows up. And then they're like, well, I didn't understand X, Y, and Z, or, you know, I didn't ex understand all the companies that were underlying. I see this happen with a lot of people that just invest blindly into sector ETFs and stuff like that. Where when you invest in some of these sector ETFs, depends on each ETF, of course, sometimes you're also buying the dog shit in the sector as well as the good companies in the sector. And so even though you might be thinking the sector is going up or technology as a whole is going up, you're also going to potentially have some companies that are in there that are dog shit. And with that, mm -hmm. the value of that sector ETF might stay flat. And you're like, I don't get it. I thought tech was going to the moon. So just kind of keep that in, in, into, into the back of your mind. And um, I'll give it back to Chris. But the, these yeah. prospectuses are very valuable. So one of the things in this prospectus, you can see any time on or after September 30th, 2024, we may redeem the Series 2 preferred shares, which is what this one is, in whole or in part amounts legally available for a redemption price of 25. So if you can buy this at 12 right now, the company at its option has the ability to buy this back at 25. You see what I mean? So there are also events that can happen which require this company to, to basically fulfill it's full redemption price if it gets bought out or if there's other things that happen. So these are something called triggering events. Like you see this one right here, upon optional redemption upon change of control triggering event. This is the reason why we bought Tel Z 
Because if, let's say, someone comes in and buys Tellurian's asset, that is considered, you know, or they buy Tellurian out, that's controlled a change of control triggering event, which means automatically those Tells um, bonds, they go from being, what, $9 right now to being $25 instantly, like that. So just, you know, but don't do that. Don't don't rely on my information. You you, you They could just as well go bankrupt. So, you yeah. know. Yeah. So yeah. understand the risk, understand the risk. Um, so yeah, this is, this is it. There's a lot more to it, but I'm not going to sit here and explain to everyone over a long period of time. It's going to be, yeah. you know, but I think BPYPM and some of its other contemporaries are going to do good. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're looking for other ones, I mean, this is, this isn't exactly what kind of Chris is talking about because this is specifically focused on a conglomerate of different, um, preferred shares that are kind of rolled under one, but uh, this I'm sure will, with with the cuts and in interest rates, show up in a pretty good way in the coming months. Uh, but I'm not specifically saying invest in this, but this allows you to. This is like a seven percent yielder, but this allows you to potentially see if you go to the perspective of this. There's ten holdings in here, top eleven percent. There's a lot of different opportunities within here, of which one caught my eye, which is Next Era Energy. I know that that, just like Brookfield property uh, guys, is also being impacted heavily due to uh, interest rates. So I immediately pulled that one up, and let me share that one now. And there was something that is redeemable as of September 2025, uh, and this was just uh, issued at $50 a share. And so this one, um, it potentially... Uh, can it's already kind of at forty dollars or so, so technically it's decreased in terms of value uh, by about 20 percent or so. But it's a six point nine percent yielder at fifty bucks, so that means it's yielding eight eight and a half percent at forty dollars. And also, if it's going to be redeemed in about a year year and a half time, you're automatically getting that uh, that if if the company is still solvent, which I anticipate next era energy. Uh, will still be solvent by September 2025, then this one could be a good opportunity as well. So if you're a retiree and you're looking for a little bit of income, this could be your guy. You buy it 40 bucks, you hold it for a year and a half. They might redeem it. They might not. They pay you an 8% dividend in the meantime, and uh, and you get 50 bucks if they do redeem it. So what's the problem associated with that? You know, that could be a good opportunity. Uh, to, to kind of look into and, and it kind of goes back to what Chris is kind of talking about. But at the same time, you have to recognize cash these days is getting 5%, but you can't lock in cash yield at 5% unless you buy some sort of CD or something like that. And as we just kind of alluded to, Jay Powell is going to cut rates. So that 5% cash yield in your money market account will soon be back to four bucks, be back to three bucks. So you have to find opportunities, especially if you're a an income investor or you're a dividend investor that's maybe later in your life that doesn't want to take on the risk or exposure and in investing in equities when it could go down 20% or so in a year. Um, these are the things that you might be able to look at um, to, to be able to get a little bit more guaranteed. It's not guaranteed 100%, but it's a little bit more guaranteed potentially than investing in a normal common equity uh, like just regular AT and T shares or regular Next Era Energy shares. Just to dial back, I'm going to show you guys a quick video on Brookfield. I think it's very important that people understand why I'm particularly bullish on the office sector. And uh, this was actually an interview that was done by the CEO of Brookfield Property Partners, Brian Kingston, um, not too long ago. So let's take a look at that. There, according to our sources, that Brookfield is in the verge of raising $15 billion right now for a new flagship property fund. How are you going to be putting all that money to work? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Shelly. And um... so first and foremost, the reason why they're raising capital, I'll give you guys a hint. It's because there's opportunity. When there's opportunity, these guys raise money, they buy stuff on the cheap, and then they ride the wave higher. So if anyone knows who Brookfield is, Brookfield is not a small time shop. They've got over $800 billion in assets managed, like total assets managed. They manage money for sovereign wealth funds, for pension funds. It's They're not a small sponsor by any means. So I just want to clarify that first. 
you know, look, we're, we think we're coming into a very interesting period of time for real estate investment. Um, you know, over the last number of years, there has been um, a, a pretty big buildup in, in inventories, et cetera, of real estate. And so we're seeing big rapid price adjustments happening around the world. And our, our business really is globally diversified, as, as, as you showed on the chart there. Uh, we're in every major asset class around the world uh, on, in 30 countries. And, and really, our business is investing in the backbone uh, of the world's economy. And, and so we have a front row seat for, for all of these changes and, and, uh, and other things that are happening. And so we think we're coming into a, a, a great period of time where we're going to be able to put that capital to work at, at great returns. I'm really curious about the office buildings here. I mean, it's a very controversial space right now. There are a lot of questions about how offices will make it through any hiccups in the market, especially given all of the changes around how and where people work. How are you viewing the office space in particular? Well, you know, we, we, when we talk about office, I think it's really important to distinguish between, um, you know, high quality, modern, purpose built office and older commodity, more traditional office that, that's becoming quickly uh, functionally obsolete. Uh, and so we often say that we're, we're not overbuilt in office, we're under demolished. And, and what I mean by that is, is uh, a lot of the issues or the vacancy that you're referring to is really concentrated in a pretty small component of the market. 90% of the vacancy. Uh, in the U.S. right now is in the bottom 30 uh, percent of the market. And so for those higher quality buildings like the ones that we own, Brookfield Place and Manhattan West, occupancy is actually very high. Uh, we're hitting uh, you know, record rental growth at, at Manhattan West. Uh, Two Manhattan West is about to open up later on this year. Rents there are 35 percent higher than the tower uh, that we completed right next door five years ago. So uh, it's important when you talk about commercial office to really distinguish between that, uh... So this is exactly why I invested in SLG, right? Because the class A assets, everyone thinks, oh, office is dead. Office is dead. No, no, location, no. Location, look... location, location, baby. Right. Exactly. Location. As long as you have prime real estate with newer buildings, you are getting commanding rents right now. So and one, of the, one of the things, so like Chris, Chris messages me on like some random Saturday. This is before we we're doing cash for chronic. He's like, check this out. So I start reading this. I'm like, you mean to tell me that these guys are going to have ownership of a casino in fucking Times Square and I'm not going to be a part of it? You're wrong. I bought shares the next goddamn Monday. It was fucking great. And I'm up 100%. I'm up 100%. I think. Uh, and, you and you got the dividends. And you got dividends for the last seven years. Seven, yep. uh, seven and I'm about months. to get a dividend tomorrow morning. I'm going to wake up and I have another 90 bucks in my pocket. Uh, it's yep. not nearly as much as probably Chris has. Actually, while we're on the, the subject, you, you misspoke on finance junkies. So let me give you an opportunity to, to kind of mm -hmm. um, reiterate what you were, what yeah. you were chatting about. Yeah, no, no, no. I, so I sold some SLG today and I bought something else that went down. So I don't want to sell what I just have right away. And cause I still believe in the other thing as well. So I don't want to face the wash value for that other thing. So like I said, I'm I'm a bit per confused, so I'm I'm just gonna let this one ride out like just normal, because I don't want to be in a position where I sell out of SLG to, I mean I sold out of SLG to buy something, just to have to sell it again really quickly back and forth at a loss, and then I have and then then I want to buy it back at you know before the 30 day mark because SLG short short thing didn't work out, so that's why I just wanted to clarify. No, SLG is not a wash sales for me because you only do wash sales on things that you are tax loss harvesting on, which means that you don't buy the same security within 30 days of that sell. That's what it was. Right. So, right. Yep. Uh, do we want to go down this rabbit hole with respect to high vacancies for 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 Manhattan and, and all that stuff. We want to bring up that chart. It's recovery. Really... It's it's not really right this minute, but let's finish this video and then we can talk yeah. about it a little bit. Yep. Uh, you know, higher quality, modern purpose built. Oh, and by the way, their assets are not just in the US. Brookfield has assets. Properties are in Canary Wharf in London, New York, the concentration, which is another thing I like about them also, that they're very well diversified around the world, so. You, know, you kind of hinted here in the big bet on New York City in particular, but how do you feel about the future of some of these cities? New York City, San Francisco, LA, clearly LA and San Francisco have been facing some really clear pressures. Yeah, you know, I've, we've been doing this for a long time. I've been doing this for a long time. I think this is now the fourth uh, cycle that I've been through that, that uh, San Francisco was down and out. Um, it always comes back. And, and uh, you know, I think longer term, uh, there's a lot of reasons to be bullish about San Francisco. It is... Um, you know, really the center for 
um, a, a lot of intellectual property within the United States. Uh, it's a fantastic market to to live and work in. It's going through some challenges right now, but we do think, you know, any any forecast looking five, 10, 15 years down the road, technology is going to be a bigger part of our lives than it is today. And San Francisco is is really the center of excellence for that. What about Los Angeles? We've reported also that in downtown Los Angeles, you faced a building where there was a default on a loan. Do you stick with downtown LA? You know, Los Angeles is still the second most populous city in the country. Uh, there's a lot of investment opportunities to happen there. We have an enormous uh, logistics business uh, in uh, Southern California. Uh, it's a major entry point, obviously, into the United States. And, uh, you know, there's not enough being built there. So we, we think there's great investment opportunities in logistics in Los Angeles and in Southern California. Uh, housing continues to be in very high demand there. We're not building, still not building enough homes. Uh, and so multifamily and other sectors like that. Um, but, you know, as I say, with office, there is uh, a certain component of the market where, where it is more challenging because of the, the age of some of those assets. And I think that'll get worked through in time. Most of those buildings will get repurposed into uh, other things or, or continue to exist. Let's talk more about those defaults, because there are a lot of questions about how much more the market. Is this is probably the most important part that's coming up when it comes to defaults. A lot of people see Brookfield and default together. And they're like, oh, my God, the company's going bankrupt. Like, no, when it comes to secured assets like buildings, each building can, has its own mortgage with its own lender with its own. Well, sometimes they have multiple lenders, but each thing is its own own thing. So sometimes offices or owners of office buildings will strategically default. And he'll explain why. And I think it's actually worth looking at. It is bound to see in terms of default rates. Obviously, you're one of the biggest players in town. You and Blackstone have both faced defaults on certain properties. Bring us inside what that process looks like and the decision there. Yeah, well, in, and I think it's important to distinguish between um, a, a default on a commercial loan and, and what most people think of with a residential uh, mortgage default. And, and oftentimes defaults get described as uh, mailing the keys back to the lenders. That's not at all what's happening uh, in these situations where you're reading about it. Oftentimes these defaults are really just part uh, one step uh, in the negotiation or in, in a restructuring of, of these loans. And so, you know, as one of the largest uh, users of the capital markets, you know, we have a great relationship with all of our lenders. We're not mailing keys into people and walking away from assets. And we're sitting down and working constructively with those lenders. And in many cases, for example, we had a, a default on a building in Denver recently that has now uh, resulted in a five-year extension on the loan and, and it's, it's back in good stand. This is called some, a, a, a thing called extend and pretend. Okay. What happens is Let's say you have a building, office building, you financed it at a 3% rate for the next five years. The five-year mark is coming up and your occupancy has gone from 100% to 75%, right? Now it's uneconomical to keep that building because the cost of operating that building plus the interest payments don't make it a cash flowing business. Well, what can you do? Well, one, you could just go to the lender and say, hey, listen, I know that this debt is coming up. And I could just give you the building building as a as the as a collateral to you, but what would you do with it? You would basically be sitting on an office building that's partially empty, and banks don't want to sit on you know assets that they they have to figure out how to run. So a lot of times the banks are in a bind, and so banks don't want to recognize any losses by fire selling anything. So most of the time they will they'll extend out the loan further. Now with the Federal Reserve saying, hey, listen, we are likely to be cutting next year and the year after that and the year after that, a lot of banks are saying, hey, guess what? We don't mind extending this, the, these loans because we know in the future the rates are going to come down. And at the same time, the occupancy levels on a lot of these commercial real estate buildings are actually going up and actually improving again because a lot of work from home is being destroyed. So this company is going to do well. Um, let's finish this real quick and then I'll keep explaining. Standing. And so I think this is all a natural part of, uh, you know, working through the impact of some of the changes that we've seen with interest rates over the last 12 months. We only have just about another minute here. Curious about the cost of debt. There's a lot of questions about higher interest rates, the lagged effects. How dramatically is the cost of debt rising, especially with such massive players like the regional banks stepping out of the market or being constrained? 
Well, I think over the last 12 months, we've seen a really um, uh, concentrated change in those interest rates, both because of the uh, increases put through by the Fed, but also the widening of credit spreads that we're seeing in real estate. And a lot of that was driven by turmoil in the, um, in the regional banks. Um, we're starting to see all of that calm down now. The markets are, are settling back in. We expect rates are going to settle in at some point. Uh, the Fed obviously is closer than it, it was a year ago to um, you know, stopping raising rates. And we think there's a lot of scope for spreads to come back down. So we actually see over... This, this was like five months ago. So that's why he's, yeah. not, he's talking. And I think, I think what, people, what people also need to recognize, and I know you have a point to finish about you know this, this in particular, is I think... What people also need to recognize is all these different investment vehicles are taxed differently. Preferred shares are taxed as regular dividend income. And so not like it's uh, ordinary income from oh, a nine to five oh, no, no, job. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. So because of the way that Brookfield Brookfield's um, preferreds are structured, they actually get treated as ordinary income. Not as, uh, not as, um, not, not as, as dividend uh, income? No. No. Really? Why is I thought most preferred shares got treated like normal dividend income. Nope. With with this one, it's a little bit different. They get treated as ordinary income. That's okay. one of the well, caveats. That's, yeah. That's something everyone has to kind of keep in mind because I was gonna mention, and somebody else in the chat was asking about how things are taxed differently. REITs are taxed differently. You have to think if the company is getting preferred tax tax treatment, like master limited partnerships, real estate investment trusts, um, other limited partnerships. Those will all be getting, you're not necessarily a shareholder in those companies. You're more of a partner. And with that, you end up having you to pay ownership. the taxes. Yeah, you're, you're paying taxes on behalf. And just like if, if you own part of a business and you get a K-1, right? It's the same sort of thing. You're being taxed at the partner level, not at the company level. And that's part of the debt vehicle that you're kind of setting up. And so, uh, Chris, what you're saying is that it's the same thing with this particular preferred share as well, right? Not all preferred shares are treated like this, but this one is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to, you have to look at, oh, let's finish this and then I'll show you guys the, the provisions for that. Oh, sorry. Over the next 12 months, uh, those cost of interest rates actually uh, moderated. Okay. Damn it, Chris. Always. It's like a damn child. Um, but anyway, in, in a few minutes here, we're going to jump over to the other stream, which is going to be Rocket Lab. So I'm just going to put that in the uh, in the chat box for you guys if you want to sync that up, because that's where we will be headed as soon as we get Chris uh, up and, and off uh, here within hopefully the next two or three minutes or so. And is he not coming back? He's just calling it a day. Oh, there he is. The myth, the legend. Yeah, I freaking hate that thing, man. Uh, you can't blame it on uh, on uh, on Studio Labs anymore either. You, you gotta. It's me. It's it was definitely me. It's you so, there. so when you are buying any securities, a lot of times, banks. I mean, not just banks, but companies will illustrate what the tax treatment is. So if you look at here for Brookfield's preferred shares, right? If you look at it uh, right here, tax information, it'll tell you that, hey, you are actually going to be getting a K-1 for this okay. for this uh, thing. And the way that you're treated is, is based on this right here. So this is the notice that it came up as. But it's basically, I'm not going to bore you guys with this, but it basically means that this is going to be treated as ordinary income for mm. all intents of purposes, you know. Mm. Well... I appreciate it, Chris. I don't know if you're interested, but we're about to launch this rocket here in about 12 minutes. I don't know if you want to jump over with me to the other stream or you're going to call it a night and get to work. Uh, nah, more I'm gonna than get to work, to man. I got to keep I got to keep providing the Patreon more and more content, man. I got to keep going. I appreciate um, it, man. I appreciate I, it. I do have to say one thing. If you are not part of the Patreon, you're still in the free part of the Patreon. Join now and secure yourself a lifetime membership for whatever it is, the $10 and the, and the, the $25 for the inner circle, because starting January 1st, that is going bye-bye. And the only thing that you will be left with is a higher rate. So, mm. you know, great investment to make for Christmas is join Chris's Patreon for $10 and you're grandfathered into a lifetime of, discounting versus uh everyone who joins in the future and i am not going back i don't care how like you could tell me like hey i'm your 
I'm your brother's nephew's cousin. He hooked me up with the 2024 price. Not going to, I mean, 2023 price. I'm not going back because at that point I would be going against my word. And there's two things uh, that I don't do. I don't break my word and I don't break my balls for anybody. You know okay, what that's Scarface. from? All right. Scarface. Yeah, it's from Scarface. You got it. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Good old Tony Montana over here. But Tony yeah, I guess Montana. if you guys are interested, uh, of course, this will probably roll over to the, the streaming channel as well. We'll probably do memberships over there. But if you guys are interested as well, doing memberships on the Matt Money channel, all that money gets reinvested back into the public account. Um, so we will uh, we will hopefully continue to do extremely well. Chris is going to get ready for work. I see him opening up his la uh, his monitor in the background. I am personally going to switch over to the uh, Rocket Lab launch that I put up in the chat. So if you guys are interested, Chris, as always, thank you. Uh, over 100 folks following us again today on the live stream. Always excited. And hopefully we can get the Cashflow Chronicles channel. It's at 79 right now. So hopefully we can get to 100 by the end of the night. Uh, so someone's like, day. don't be, don't be like meet Kevin, bro. I am not gonna. I am. I have no ass. Buy my course. To meet Kevin. I have no courses. I don't give any courses whatsoever. Only thing I do is I point in the directions that I, I'm looking at, and if you guys want to follow, you can. And then I point in another direction. You guys can follow that. That's just how it is, man. Yeah. You know? Cool. All right, my guy. I'll talk to you in a bit. Thanks as always. Have a great weekend. Later. Take care. Later, bros. Bye.